Churches are made up of all different kinds of people, and um, that's the uniqueness of the body of Christ. Amen? And so, praise the Lord. I'm going to speak to you today about something I've never preached on before, so this will be fun for you and me, uh, called the spirit of sloth. The spirit of sloth. <clears throat> and then, and as I was thinking about this message, it just happens that today... Um, Today is a Super Bowl, and so I'm going to use this as an illustration because the people who were playing today got there, or I should say, they didn't get there by not working hard. They didn't get there by sleeping in and not watching game films. They didn't get there by skipping practice. They, they didn't get there by, uh, they got there by working hard, and they, they worked really hard for something that whoever wins today is going to get a ring. Woo! Okay, now, I know it's significant, and, and I've, trust me, to have a Super Bowl ring means more than the value of the ring. There's it's all that's tied up into that, so I understand that. But you know, we are living and serving for a crown that's imperishable. And, and there is, the things of this world are perishing. How much more should we be running to win the race for a crown that will last forever? And so my encouragement is going to be for us today to keep in mind that we are running the race right now and that we're not to be slothful in it. And I want to talk to you today about slothfulness because, well, just think about it. Can we have that picture of the sloth again? There it is. Don't they look cute? I mean... They're just so cuddly, and, and if you were to come across a sloth, you would just, well, you'd want to hold it, right? Because all they do is just like, yeah, I mean, don't, don't let them fool you. Sloths can pull their full body weight up from the time of birth. They can do a pull-up with one arm, full body weight. And uh, they're, they're like three times the strength of, of other animals in, in as far as size ratio. Don't let them fool you. But they just, they're, they're sloths. And they're cuddly. And if, you, if you're going to cuddle and, and, and snuggle up to a sloth, you just can't be like, hey, Mr. Sloth, let's play. Let's play. What do you think? No, what do you have to do? You have to become slothful. Like a sloth, right? And so that cuddliness, that temptation to, to just want to sleep in a little longer. I won't go there, okay? We'll talk about something else. I want to help you run the race today, and I want to help you understand how the sloth wants to keep you out of the supernatural bowl, all right? <clears throat> now, there's a, a plaque. If you ever went to a Christian bookstore in the 80s or the 90s, You've probably bought this. You've seen it. It's, it's probably a bookmark, a greeting card that you sent or got sent. And it's called Footprints in... You all know it, right? And it's a story about the guy who had a dream that he was walking. His life was walking along with God. And uh, he looked back and there was footprints, two sets of footprints. But he noticed during the difficult times of his life, there was only one set of footprints and so he asked God, what happened? How come there's only one set? And God said, because in the difficult times, I was carrying you. Oh. And it's touching. I have another version of footprints in the sand I want to read to you today. I got this from James Emery White. And it says this. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow, the walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. Because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. (laughs) 
Now, I don't think that's probably going to make it to a greeting card anywhere. And you're probably not going to hang that anywhere in your house. I don't know. This is right. You, this is my church, and you guys are probably going to be requesting this one soon. Um, there is there is something about this, though, that it's important for us to understand because slothfulness is a critical barrier to spiritual transformation, a critical barrier to us growing and becoming the disciples that we're called to become. I want to read to you a quote from Dorothy Sayers, and I think it was, it was in a public speech. She was speaking to, uh, it might have been Parliament, like 1941, and uh, she says, Sloth is <clears throat> that which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive only because there is nothing it would die for. Sloth could be defined as whatever. Whatever. And we think that sometimes. We say that sometimes. We're faced with a critical thinking moment and we go, I don't have the answer. Whatever. Or you got it wrong. Whatever. Everybody disagrees with your thoughts about Christ. Whatever. Whatever. Yet at the same time, sloth manifests itself in some very specific ways. And I want to give you six faces of sloth to help you recognize when it shows up where you are. Okay? Number one, the face of laziness. The face of laziness. Ecclesiastes 10.18 says, Through laziness, the rafters sag. Because of idle hands, the house leaks. The rafters sag, meaning, you know, what's holding up the roof, they sag. And and it leaks because we're just too lazy to fix it. Too lazy to do something about it. We know it's wrong. We're just too lazy to do something about it. Some of you have not physical homes, but spiritual homes and relationships in your homes that are broken and you could fix them if the spirit of sloth wasn't keeping you from it. You, you're able, you've been able to see that there's a, a, a problem here. It needs to be addressed. And in order to address the problem, it's going to call you out of your comfort zone where you are spiritually to go <laughs> deeper in Christ And in order to go deeper in Christ, it's going to make you come out of your complacency and and, and get out of your bed, as Proverbs refers to the sluggard who won't even get out of bed. And yet you know the problem, you see the problem, you know the solution, but you still do nothing. That's the face of laziness. And I'm, what I'm talking to you about today isn't the physical aspects of this. You can apply it physically if the shoe fits. I'm talking to you about your relationship with the Lord, okay? <clears throat> and there's an ironic side to laziness, and it's this. You keep yourself busy, so busy, doing other things than the thing that you know that you should be doing, that it's still Roof leaks, rafter sag. You say, but I'm so busy. I've got so much to do. Yes, but your house is falling apart. I'm not talking about the physical house. I'm talking about the spiritual house. There's, some of us have leaks and the rafters are sagging. And the Holy Spirit has put his finger on it and said, this needs to be fixed. And we're like, I'll get to it. I just got so much work to do. Whoo, look at me. I'm a working man. And I'm working really hard to, to be the, the support of my family. That's it. That's it. I'm working really hard. And so I'm distracted is what you are. Oh. 
<clears throat> the face of laziness. Another face is the face of tolerance. And the face of tolerance, just it's not, it's not being tolerant of other people. It's what you tolerate yourself. It's accepting where you are and that, well, I don't need to change. I'm good. I'm good. And I had this thought, too. Again, as I get older, I start thinking more about these things. That there, there are people who have entered and I've seen entered into retirement. And it's almost like we stopped working now and now we've stopped growing, too. We've stopped, the putting our, we've stopped applying ourselves to kingdom growth because the kingdom that we were living in, we've stopped working. And so it's just like, hey, let's just put crews on for everything now. The face of tolerance. How many, dis, how many times have you heard somebody say this phrase, you've got to love me like I am? And that's very popular today. And Jesus does that, by the way. Jesus, if you are here today and you're not walking with Christ and you're seeking to know if he's real and you got questions about that, I'm so glad that you're here today. And, and I, want to, I want to encourage you that where you may not have it all together, guess what? None of us do. All right? None of us do. And if somebody sitting next to you says they do, move away. All right? <clears throat> all of us have issues. But Jesus meets us where you are. And I want you to know this. Jesus wants to meet you where you are. And you don't... The thing that you have to acknowledge is that he loves you and that he wants a relationship with you. And you begin there. But for those of us who are walking in Christ, Jesus loved us enough to meet us where we were. And he loves us enough not to do what? Leave us there. Second Corinthians tells us that we are to go from glory to glory, which means what? I'm changing. I'm transforming. I don't stay the same that I was. I'm changing into the image of God. It says that the Spirit of God that lives in us when we become saved, that now that Spirit is changing us into the, into the image of God. But you know that sanctification is a big word of what this means, just changing to be like Jesus. Sanctification is empowered by the Spirit, but it's done by us. You have to do something. Oh, well, if God wants to change me, he'll change me. He put his spirit in you. He gave you his living word. He's given you direct communication with him. And he says, now I want you to transform, to change. So many things around us today need to change, but they will never change until the church is willing to change itself. We are to be continually growing. You should not look the same in your spiritual growth today that you did last year at this time. You should not look the same as you did last week. The Spirit of God should be continued. You should have a fresh testimony every day. Hello. Hello. Listen, I'm not drawing today, so I've got to put my energy somewhere else. <laughs> we are to... <laughs> And listen, <laughs> what's bad is when you think you've arrived and then you want the glory. I got a video. I want you to take a look at this video. Chased by BB. What's out? Did he get across? Is it knocked out of his hand before? There's the uh, He celebrated too soon. No, that's Jeff Goat. Well, that's, he's got to make That was just for all you Cowboy fans. That's the moment that's never forgotten. Did you hear what he said at the end? He would have scored, but he slowed down to celebrate. God, look what you did in my life five years ago. And you know what? I don't know if you noticed it in the video. He's turning and he's looking this way and he's celebrating. And he's slowing down. He had a moment back here. It's a Super Bowl. He's got the moment. He's celebrating, slowing down, 
And he didn't know that coming behind him was the opposition. And he knocked the ball out of his hands. And it cost him the touchdown. It cost him. And now he's a YouTube sensation um, for all the wrong reasons. (laughs) Don't think that you have arrived. Don't ever tolerate where you are and think to yourself, I don't need to grow anymore. Peter has this moment with Jesus. Jesus says to him, Peter, you're a rock. Peter's like, yes, I knew it. And just a few verses later, he goes, Peter, you're Satan. We're continuing to grow from glory to glory, and we should never tolerate. Sloth wants you to tolerate where you're, where you're at. Don't celebrate the victory until you're in the end zone. And the end is the end. When Jesus comes back or you die, you run this race until it's over. And we continue to grow. Another face is the face of apathy. And apathy is is dangerous. Apathy towards the things of God is as dangerous as aggression towards God. Because it's Instead of just being mad at, mad at God, it's like, whatever. 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 The creator of the universe just wrote you a letter and said, this is this and this is this. And you go, whatever. Luke 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. What's he talking about? When Jesus returns, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, as it was when the flood happened in Noah's day, it's going to be like the day when I come back. And here's what's going on. People were eating, drinking, marrying, having Super Bowl parties, being given in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. That's right. There were Super Bowls back then. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. They were eating and drinking and going to school and buying and selling. It sounds just a lot like the society that we live in today. We're buying and selling and eating and drinking and going. What what Jesus is saying is that you're going to be going about life as usual. Unless you have a mind to the, the spirit of God, unless your eyes are lifted up to heaven, you're going to be going through life as usual, no big deal, and then the Son of Man comes back and you weren't prepared. We feel pretty safe here in the United States of America. And I'm grateful for our military and for our law enforcement. I just want to celebrate them. They lay down their lives so that we can be secure and that we can be safe. So grateful for that. And at the same time, because of, listen, they're not sleeping and slumbering. They're attentive and alert so that you can rest well. But when we begin to reflect our culture and begin to allow that to affect our spirit, we begin to sit back on our haunches in the spirit. We begin to say, I live a comfortable life. Why do I have need for? Not much. Hey, I should just take a chill pill. Whatever. I'm just comfortable. There's really no battles going on right now. I mean, yeah, over the other parts of the world. Nothing really. Here, right here, you know what? I just saw an article yesterday. Cape Coral uh, was voted the happiest, number one, happiest place in Florida. Happiest city in Florida. And there's some statistics that they figured that out. Okay. God bless them. I don't know how they did that. But <clears throat> anyway, we are, we are the, we're in the, we're in the, the right in the center of this conversation right now, that everything is just happy, we're, except for Hurricane Ian. Besides that, we're happy. I don't know when they did that survey. Maybe we should go back and look at that. <clears throat> but we're living in this place of 
happiness and, and, and we live in a, a nation that's so secure, we have become aloof to what's going on in the spirit just because we don't have some of the things that are demanding a, a struggle spiritually on us doesn't mean that you can sit back and rest spiritually and become aloof and apathetic in the spirit you have to continue to war your enemy is not sleeping he is le- he's working and looking around seeking whom he may devour he is not he's not going to take a break there's no half time for him there's no timeouts for him he's always looking for you to put your shield of faith down And the moment that you put your shield of faith down, he's drawn. He's got a compound bow. He's holding it. He can hold it all day long. As soon as you take that, as soon as you put the shield down a little bit, he's like, bing. Because he knows humanity. But we know our God. Right? We know our God. Dr. Lawrence Gould, who was a former president of Carleton College, said, I do not believe the greatest threat to our future is from bombs or guided missiles. I don't think our civilization will end that way. I think it will die when we no longer care. 19 of 21 civilizations have died from within and not by conquests from without. There were no bands playing and flags waving when these civilizations decayed. It happened slowly in the quiet and in the dark when no one was aware. Just like the days of Noah, we're going on about our lives. Don't worry. E. And the Lord wants you to be happy. He just wants you to live aware. With an urgency, a sense of a spirit of urgency. Another face of sloth is the face of procrastination. And that's the whisper that persuades us that there's no need to hurry. It tells us that there's no sense of urgency. You can do it later. We know what we need to do. We just don't do it now. Can't ever quite bring ourselves to do it. In Luke 9, verse 59, Jesus says again, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. Wow. Doesn't that sound kind of hard? But you know, when you hear Jesus saying something that sounds kind of hard, it's because he sees something underneath their heart that's even harder. And he's, he's, he's trying to speak. He's got to speak that way to get in. And he says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, everybody say, but first. You know what that is? Procrastination. Jesus says, I want you to do this. And you go, I, yeah, but first. But first what? But first you? That's what you're saying. But first me. First me. No, no. That's not lordship. That's me ship. That's my ship. First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if I have the next verse, but in chapter 10, verse 1, I do. Okay, it says, and after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, church, I want you to listen closely because this is personal. Jesus is saying, don't be apathetic. He's saying, don't be lazy. He's saying, don't be tolerant. He's saying here, don't procrastinate. And we are, we have been talking about bless every home, bless every home. And Jesus has this conversation. He says, I told these people to go. And they said, I can't. And he said, shame. And then he says, told you to go. And they said, I can't. And he's like, wrong. And then he turns around to his disciples. He says, I'm sending you two by two to go and proclaim the good news. And I'm making this connection here because I believe the spirit of the Lord is speaking to our body right now in this moment. And he is saying, I've called you into this city. 
I've called you into this region. I'm sending you into this region. Do not procrastinate. Today is the day of salvation for someone. And we cannot sit back in our beds and say, I'm too tired. I'll do it another time. You don't know when another time will be. It's just as the days of Noah and the days of Sodom. And we think that we have time, but we don't know when the Son of Man is coming. We don't know when the last opportunity for us to do what we need to do could be. Some of you are saying, give him that iPad back and let him draw some more. Psalm 95, verse 7 says, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. If only you would listen to his voice today. The Lord says, listen to these next four words very carefully. Don't Harden your heart. Why would you not listen to the Lord today? Because you would have hardened your heart. Do not harden your heart. Well, pastor, I would never intentionally do that. You're right. You wouldn't intentionally do it, but you would do it subliminally. And you'll do it subconsciously till it manifests itself in your life. A little sleep, a little slumber. I just talked to my staff this past week about no snooze. Do not live by your snooze button. And in the spirit, there should be no snooze. We've the alarm has already sounded. Jesus said, "Today, today, don't wait for another alarm. Don't wait to reach over if it hits again. Me, okay, I'll get up the next time. There may not be a next time. The alarm's already sounded. It's already gone off. The last face I want to talk to you about is the face of circumstance, and this is when we." Allow the situations that we encounter to dictate how we live. And more specifically, not just what we do, but what we don't do. Not the sin of commission, but the sin of omission. Sloth says, don't bother. Just go with the flow. Easy peasy. Sing some Grateful Dead or something. Just <laughs> Romans 13, 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. There it is. The hour has already come. Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside. 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 Did you get that? The deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently. Let us behave decently. Let us behave decently. Now is the time. Now is the time. Let us, let us. The Spirit of God is willing. The flesh here is weak. Let us, let us, let you and me, let us behave in such a way. Let us act in such a way. As in the daytime. You know something, an interesting fact about sloths? They become blinded in bright daylight. They can't see in bright daylight. They they move better in shadows. Their vision is much better in, in darkness. 
a little heavy here, isn't it? Even another fact, they also only poop once a week. <laughs> All right, I just had to... <clears throat> What is Paul saying here? He's saying you may not be in control or able to control your circumstance, but you can control you in your circumstance. You can determine how you're going to respond in your moment. You have that ability. You can't control the things around you, but you can determine how you're going to be in them. You can start telling yourself now before you get there and then you don't have the strength to do it. You can start telling yourself now, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. I will be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, make my, my problems known to the Lord. I will do that. I will do that now. I will not lack zeal, but I will be fervent in spirit. You can speak to your soul now. Proverbs 13, 4 says that a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. What does the Spirit of God want us to do? He wants us to get out of bed, okay? Not physically, spiritually. He wants you to stop being lazy in the spirit, slothful in the spirit, and he wants to move you to diligence so that you're in a perpetual state, not of anxious. Listen, anxiety is the world's response to this. Is I'm nervous. I gotta, I gotta keep moving. We gotta keep busy. We gotta. That's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God is that I'm fervent. I'm intentional. I know I'm directional. I'm busy about the kingdom's work. It doesn't cons I'm consumed by him. I'm not consumed by anything else. I'm not anxious for anything. I'm not troubled about the days. I know what day it is. Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. I know that today is the day that slumber is over. I'm to be awake. I'm living in this moment right now. And I'm not concerned because he holds the circumstance. Last verse, <clears throat> Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, everybody say the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The Bible is saying you will see the reward. You will get the prize. Uh, God will give you the crown of life. If you do not faint in the day of adversity. If you do not give up. He says, you will. You will. God is for you. The spirit of sloth is against you. It doesn't come from, it's a spirit that does not come from heaven. It's a spirit of deception by the devil that would love to keep you and keep you from doing that which you've been called to do. What legacy? Listen, I, I'm just, I'm pulling all the strings right now. What legacy do you want to leave behind you? Butt prints in the sand? I know it's funny and it's like, yeah. But let's be serious for a moment. Because if, if you succumb to those faces, you've been hindered. Here's the good news. You can walk out of that bed. You can, you can roll over. You know the... Proverbs 26 talks about the guy who's a sluggard. He's in the bed. He's so lazy. He just turns like a hinge. It just turns from side to side. And you know what he says? He conjures up in his own mind. He says, there's a lion outside. And then a few verses later, he says, I'm pretty smart. What he's done is created his own, his own world. 
You deceive yourself into thinking that I can do it later. I don't need to do it now or I don't need to do it all. It doesn't really matter. Whatever. Those are lies, church. There are people who are lost. There are people who are hurting. There are people who are broken. There are people who are in need. They live right around the corner from you. They work right around the cubicle from you. They sit right across the desk from you. And they need somebody who's walking in the Spirit. They need somebody who's aware of the day that it is. Today, today, today. Don't harden my heart. I will not harden my heart today. I'm going to be sensitive, Lord. What do you want to do through me today, today? I'm ready. Give me a spirit of fervor. Let's pray. Father, would you give us a spirit of fervency? Would you give us a spirit of urgency? Would you cause us, Lord, to be diligent? To be diligent about the things of God. Lord, we shake off the spirit of sloth. We identify today these areas that we have given into, that we've looked into the face and we've beheld that rather than the face of Jesus. Today, we turn our eyes away from that. We look at you, Jesus, and we are arrested in our spirit and we say yes to you, yes to you, yes to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together. <clears throat> That's a lot to think about. Because I'm challenged myself. You know, these faces turn and I see these faces all the time. There's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to the temptation. So don't think when you walk out of here and you see these faces again, the face of sloth, you go like, oh, it does not a talk. Pastor's message didn't go into my heart. No, you just need to have a different solution. You need to have a different response. And your response is, nope, not looking at you. I'm looking at Jesus. Right? A prayer team is going to be up front. And if today you're here and you haven't, surrendered your life to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm, I've been looking at everything but you. These people would love to, to pray with you to help you take the next step in your faith. Amen? Amen. So the rest of us, we're going to shout and go out and see you at Alpha Wednesday night. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Amen. Let's go do it. God bless you.